Hello and welcome to Living Life. When I look at uh, the self-help sections of bookstores, you know, often the titles are something along the lines of, you know, you know secrets to success or habits of highly success, successful people. And it's in this you start to realize what these people try to do are, are, are find, you know, secrets or habits that people don't do and encouraging them to do. Actually, in this passage today, what we're actually going to talk about are three habits uh, that are so important for our spiritual growth, but are probably often not done or forgotten. And that's what we want to look at today. What are three things that Christians don't practice regularly, but it's so vital for our Christian walk? Esther chapter 9, verses 17 through 28. This happened on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, and on the fourteenth they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the thirteenth and fourteenth, and then on the fifteenth they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the poor, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, these days were called Purim from the word poor. Because of everything written in this letter, and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family, and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of them die out among their descendants. When you think about growing as a Christian, um, if I was to ask you, you know, what are some important disciplines for any Christian to practice. Uh, you may say uh, reading the Bible or, or prayer or maybe it might be something along the lines of evangelism or, or outreach. You have to practice your faith. Well, I'm, what I'm going to share uh, today and what we see in this passage are three things that I don't think many of us do very well. And the first uh, discipline that's so important for us is to remember God's victories. Uh, it's so important for us to to very purposefully remember God's victories in our lives. Uh, in verse 20, we see uh, Mordecai recorded 
these events. And he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far. Something so simple that we could glimpse over so quickly, but it's important to realize Mordecai, he recorded the ways in which God handed them the victory. And he wrote it down and he sent it to all the Jews throughout the provinces, near and far. What does this reveal to us? It's so important for you and I, as God always works with us, in us, through us, as God gives us victories, whether that's victories of, of accomplishments, whether that means we, we get a job, or whether it means that we uh, get married or have a child, to really remember that as God's victory, God's a gift to us when we go through a certain battle in life and as we overcome it as we overcome addictions and sins to celebrate those as God's victories I want to encourage you to to do to do to do that purposefully to uh, write it down write down the day in which God uh, hands you a victory and to claim it as a victory but in this, we start to realize there's so much more than just remembering. There's, there's so much more than simply journaling about it or writing it down. In verse 21, we see that as he recorded these events, it was to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, as the time um, when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. And how do they celebrate? To observe the days as days of feasting and joy, giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. You know, you see this. There's elements of celebration that the world does that's actually very similar to what God desires. When you celebrate a birthday, when you celebrate a, a new job, what you often do is you take people out to dinner, right? You, you celebrate with food and you feast a lot of laughter, a lot of celebration, a lot of smiles, right? That's one thing that God actually calls us to do. When, we, uh, when God gives us a gift, when we see God working in our lives, to actually celebrate that with friends, with families, to feast over that and to, and to really enjoy what God has, has given to us. But not just to stop there. L look at how... how um, a God-fearing, God-believing person celebrates. They actually not only uh, feast with food, but they also give food to one another. And this is in the idea of those who didn't have food. When God gave them a victory and people wanted to celebrate, but they couldn't, it was the idea that those who had more gave to those who had less. And together, in community, we would celebrate. But also, it doesn't end there. It goes to the point of even giving gifts to the poor. You see, as believers, when God gives us a victory, it's a reminder that it is God's grace. It's, a, it's in God's kindness. Any victory, any gift that we, re, that we receive, it's all from Him. And so as we're reminded of that, we also give to those who have less. We give to the poor. And this is, this is something that if believers were to do more often, I really wonder what the church would be like. I wonder how much more the victories that we experience would really become uh, areas in life that we actually celebrate, times in life that we actually celebrate, uh, to celebrate God's victories by giving to others. If uh, God gives us a job, to actually use that money and to celebrate with those who have less. To uh, we're called to remember God's victories. We're called to celebrate God's victories. But also this last thing, to share God's victories. Near the end of this, in verse 27 and 28, we see that what they were called to do is to write it down and to establish it and to celebrate it annually. So much so in verse 28 that every generation after them would know of what God has done. It's so that in verse 28 it says, Nor should the memory of these days, it should not die out among the, the descendants. 
what we're called to do, especially the, the great victories of life, is to share them with our children. It's this generational idea of discipleship. One thing that I do with my daughter uh, is we ask her uh, to, uh, to actually ask us uh, to ask us questions about our own childhood. And so something that we do often um, near her bedtime is simply we share stories about our childhood. It's different stories about different funny stories. But what I also try to do is throw in there ways in which God provided for me. I share my own testimony with my own daughter, even though she's young, to share God's victories with her so that my faith also becomes her faith. And it becomes something that's very real and organic. And it's in this we start to realize as we celebrate God's victories, we're called to share them with others, especially with our children. If you don't have children, I encourage you to ask your own parents about how they, they got saved, about ways in which God gave them victories in their own life, and in that, to worship God in doing so. When you start to realize how uh, faithful God is to the Israelites, you start to realize how many ways in which God gave them victory, that God was present in their life. You may feel like in your life, God isn't very active. Or you may feel like, what victories are there really in my life? But I want to encourage you, just take a moment. Uh, maybe just take a few moments today just to think about ways in which God has been faithful to you. Every gift every friendship, every relationship, and start to realize those are gifts from God. Those are ways in which you could really celebrate what, has, what God has done. And as you do that, what you'll start to realize is worship will flow out of your life. And you'll want to share that with others. So let's, let's simply pray that God would reveal that to, to, reveal that to us. Uh, God, we just want to thank you for your faithfulness in our life. And God, we just also want to confess, uh, as you are so faithful, so often we're not able to see how you are faithful. So God, we ask you that you would open up our own eyes to help us to see uh, today how you're faithful, how you've been faithful this past year, how you've been faithful in our life, and especially the big victories, the big gifts that you've given us, to really celebrate that and to really give you worship for that. God, open up our eyes and help us to see how gracious you have been with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.